the green lit but still deserted studios of Rodale Institute Radio and Television at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. It's time for another Groundhog Day episode of Chemical Free Horticultural Hijinks You Bet Your Garden. I'm your host, Mike McGrath. Do you have blossom end rot? And do your tomatoes have it also? Are you trying to compost whole leaves? And how exactly should you use arborist wood chips? Plus, cuke-free cucumbers and your fabulous phone call questions, comments, tips, tricks, suggestions, and laconically Lemurian lamentations. So keep your eyes and or ears right here, cats and kittens, because it's all coming up faster than you saving your tomatoes with a pack of Tums right after this. You're listening to an encore presentation of You Bet Your Garden. Support comes from Hot Bin Composters, designed to reduce waste and create compost within 30 to 90 days. More information at hotbincomposting-us.com. Welcome to another brand new episode of You Bet Your Garden at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. I'm your host behind the eight ball, where I always am, Mike McGrath. Coming up later in the show, we have a three-part question of the week. We're going to talk about blossom end rot on tomatoes, arborist wood chips, and something else. I forgot what, but I'll remember it when we get to the question of the week. In the meantime, let's take some of your fabulous phone calls. Maria, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hello. Hello, Maria. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. And where is Maria doing great? I live in Ontario, Canada. Oh, yes, I visited so there. Toronto. Yeah. Yeah, I've been up there. That's uh, that's a nice area. What can we do you for? Well, uh, this this year is the first time I am doing gardening, mm-hmm. vegetable gardening. Um, I planted a number of vegetables. I grew them uh, from seeds in March, and I planted them about three or four weeks ago. Right. Um. Uh. I first had problems uh, with some leaves in the cabbage. Uh, they were yellowing. Oh, uh, but okay. It, it wasn't a big deal. I wasn't very concerned because it was just the ones that were lower. The, the, the ones in the top were fine. Good. But about four days ago, I noticed that the rainbow chart was, was changing colors. The leaves had stains, sort of white stains, and then it turned black. Hmm. Um, that that's when I tried to look for answers because it wasn't just one or two leaves in every every plant, but it was like two or four or five, sometimes most of the leaves. Yeah. Okay, so are you planting in flat earth or raised beds? Raised beds. Oh, how nice. And what have you been feeding the plants, if anything? Well, um, I put compost on the soil. Mm-hmm. Um when when they were little and on their on their they were just seedlings, I would feed them uh, fish. Um, how you call this? This fish uh, fertilizer. Uh, yeah, yeah, fresh fertilizer. Yeah. Then when I when I put them on the ground, I look for organic jobs fertilizer. Yeah, jobs organic fertilizer for for fruits and vegetables. Okay. Um, well, Jobs is not organic, to the best of my knowledge, unless they de- oh, yeah. unless they developed an organic line. Yeah, any organic fertilizer is going to have the word organic on it, and it'll also have the OMRI seal of approval, at least in the States. Um, OMRI stands for Organic Materials Review Institute. But um, okay. the plant spike, I don't like the plant spikes myself. I would go back to feeding the plants, not just a fish fertilizer. I would try to find uh, a mixture that's fish and seaweed. It's very good. Fish and seaweed, okay. Now, there is a disease called cabbage yellows. Um, I haven't thought about it for a long time. Now, you've pulled off the discolored leaves, right? Yes. Okay, and has the yellowing returned? Um. Actually, the cabbages are doing great, mm-hmm. but the problem is now basically just with the rainbow chard. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you um, have you have the perfect climate for growing cabbage. Um, 
you should be able to grow monster-sized cabbages. Great. Now, chard, like kale, is often attacked by insects. Do you, uh, are, is your damage, does it look like little white lines, like roadway lines going through the leaves? It seems like it is. I actually took a leaf out and I asked one of my sons to take a better look because my eyes are not as good. Uh, he said, Mom, I cannot find any little creatures, but I do see some lines. Yep. Like, okay. You know, so, signs that some bug has crawled there. Yes, these are very miniature creatures called leaf miners, M I N E R S. And they tunnel into the leaf and they move around, and they're so small they can eat the inside of a thin leaf like that and uh, not be seen. But you see their trails. Uh -huh. So you got plenty of time. I hope you bought a lot of kale seeds. <laughs> Why? Because what I would do, once the leaf miners are in there, you can't save that leaf anymore. Do you have any? Okay. Do you have any leaves that aren't um, damaged? There are a lot of leaves damaged. I have been pulling them out, but I felt like, my God, if I pull them all out, it's just going to die. The plant, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, one thing you have to understand is that even in commercial farming, if they manage to harvest fifty to fifty-five percent of their crops, they feel they had a huge success that year. You know, oh, yeah. gardening is not for the faint of heart. You're going to lose plants, especially, did you say this is your first year? Yes. You're doing great. Now, what I would do is I would pull out all this kale that was affected and trash it. Um, if you have a really hot compost pile where you got a lot of browns in there, maybe some horse manure, you could mix it in. But if it's a cold pile of stuff just sitting there, I would just put the plants in the trash. Okay. Because you don't want the miners to hatch out of there and then infest your garden for the rest of the season. Yeah. And yeah. then the easiest thing to do with this is go to a garden center and buy a little roll of Remay, R-E-E-M-A-Y. That's the biggest brand name, but it's the basic generic name is floating row cover because Neither your cabbage nor your kale or um, chard is going to flower, or at least you don't want it to flower. So it doesn't need to be visited by bees or anything. So you put this like polyester thin blanket over top and you know you put a, a tomato cage in there or something so you can keep the, the top of the floating row cover away from the top of your plant. Uh -huh. And it will protect the plant from leaf miner attack and it'll help the plant grow bigger because it'll retain heat for nighttime. Wait a second. Yes, a second. I, I did put some kind of a covering right when I put before, right before I put the little seedlings, I did cover it. I got, um, I couldn't find exactly the product that is required for this because I was making a raised bed garden, a four by four by eight. Excellent. Feet. Mm -hmm. So, what I did is I made a structure with with PVC tubing, and I put a screen on top of the PVC tubing. Yeah, see, these creatures are smaller than the holes in the screen. Oh, wow. With, uh, with kind of normal window screening, people who grow squash will often put their squash inside a little house of window screening to keep bees away because squash pollinates readily, and these people want to save the seeds. But for you, you need a thin polyester blanket. Just ask for fro floating row cover. It's very common. Floating row cover, okay. All right? Okay. All right, well, good luck to you. Okay, so just one more question, I'm sorry. So I have to get rid of the plants, and I cannot plant anything there for the rest of the season? I don't think that that's true. I would start a new run of your rainbow chard in the same place, but if you have other locations, I would start a new run there too. And you know you can harvest chard at any size. If you see this starting to happen on one leaf, harvest it all. The smaller the leaf, the better the flavor is going to be, and you can oh. just keep seeding new runs over the whole course of the summer. Okay. 
Okay, so you don't think I should change to other kind of plant that is not subject to this disinfection, eh? Well, you you obviously like the idea of growing rainbow chard, so give it a second try. And okay. if things don't change, yes, then switch to some other kind of salad green or, you know, collard greens or kale or something like that. Okay, would this affect, affect uh, carrots and spinach no. and stuff like that? They might get into spinach. They wouldn't affect carrots because carrots don't have true leaves. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Good luck to you now. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Well, they saw it first in Southeast PA, and it's spreading further every day. It's doing our crops and trees a lot of harm. It's an insect species that's not native, reproducing at a very high rate of speed, and folks, that's cause for some alarm. Now, once you dig what I have dug, you'll be hit to this invasive bug, and friend, you'll want to help to stop it spread. And when you see that little critter gonna take a swing like a home run hitter and smash that spotted lantern fly dead. Die, 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 spotted lantern fly. When you see me coming, you'll know your end is nigh. I got a fly swatter, I'm gonna chase her all the way back to Asia. Die, 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 spotted lantern fly. In the fall, find the eggs on a wall tree trunk and scrape them off into an alcohol dunk, and surely that will cause them to expire. When the nymphs hatch from the eggs in spring, wrap your trees with a sticky tape ring, but save the birds by covering with chicken wire. Now the tree of heaven is their preferred host Yeah, that's the tree it likes the most So if you got one in your yard, chop it down Don't transport firewood, brush, or debris Cause they'll hide in there and you'll never see them Hit to ride with you to the very next town Die, 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 spotted lanternfly When you see me coming, you'll know your end is nigh I got a flash of water, I'm gonna chase you all the way Back to Asia, die, 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 spotted lanternfly Well, it's time for me to take a little break and remind everyone that the compost you began with lots of shredded leaves last fall should finally be ready now, just in time for a mid-season feeding. But don't go forking that pile just yet, because we'll be right back with important information about three, maybe four different things, plus more of your fabulous phone calls. Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by the Espoma Company, offering a complete selection of natural organic plant foods and potting soils. More information about Espoma and the Espoma Natural Gardening Community can be found at ESPOMA.com. You've been listening to an encore presentation of You Bet Your Garden. Welcome back to an all-new episode of You Bet Your Garden from the studios of Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. I am your host, Mike McGrath. Coming up later in the show, we're going to hit a triple into the right-hand corner. We're going to talk about wood chips. We're going to talk about blossom end rot, cucumber-free cucumbers, and even more. But first, more of your fabulous phone calls. Doug, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Thank you. How are you today? I am just ducky, Doug. Thank you for asking. Ducky and I are both ducky together here. Um, where are you, man? I'm in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania. Home of the storied Tower Theater. Yes, sir. Which, uh, where I saw Bruce Springsteen, David Bowie, Genesis with Peter Gabriel. Oh, my, I'm jealous. Oh, yeah, the musical box. It was amazing. Oh. Oh. And it was a very early Bruce show. He did five nights, I believe it was, in July. And the Bowie show might have been one of the best shows of all time because it was the Diamond Dogs tour with Mick Ronson. Very so, cool. Yeah, kind of made you forget what a dump the place was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What can we do for you, Doug? Well, I harvested my garlic the other day, and I ran into the same problem I had back in 2016, where uh, the the wrappers are split, the inner cloves appear to be growing, 
And I'm trying to figure out if it's weather, if I was too late, if I was too early. Well, I want to. What's going on? Yeah, no, I hear you, man. I want to stop you and say that we are recording this show towards the end of June. Okay. Uh, and normally, at least in my Pennsylvania garden, my garlic is not ready until around the 1st of July. And the signal that it's time to start testing to see if your garlic is ready is when the bottom third of the vast majority of the plants have turned brown. Not a third of the plants all the way brown, but just the bottom third of a good number of plants. What state were your stalks in? They were not in a state I would expect them to be to harvest them. They were still green, they were mm -hmm. still standing, but they were splitting with leaves growing from inside, which did not seem right. And I pulled a couple that were not split, and they were pretty large and, you know, looked half decent. And then a couple days later, they were all splitting in the center. Some were starting to, to fall a little bit. They were not 40% brown like I've had them in the past. And uh, I, I dug one up, and it was all open like I had in 2016. Huh. Uh, in 2016, they had actually all fallen over, and huh. the entire crop was, was that way. Okay, wait so, a minute. I got a, I got a million questions to ask you, okay? okay. <laughs> so we're going to go back in time, 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 time. When did you plant your garlic? Uh, this year or then? This year. Let's just stick this with This year. It, it was in the uh, end of October. Okay, that's a little late. Um, yes, I realize that. Yeah, I, you know, the, the, the old Italian uh, who gave me the best advice on garlic said to, it was like 127 years old. Um, he said, Let me guess, Columbus Day? No, no, that's what I was saying, and he corrected me. He said to plant on the first day the kids go back to school. Oh. Garlic really likes that extra time in the ground. The weather's mild. It gets to develop hardier roots. Mm -hmm. And I've always tried to do that. Um, when the kids go back to school, the garlic goes in the ground. Now, I know this is a stupid question, um, but, like, that's redundant on my show. You did plant single cloves. Yes. Okay. And raised bed, flat earth? Raised bed. Okay. Uh, mulch? Um, no. No not, mulch for the, for the garlic. Not even shredded leaves or anything? No. Okay. Never, never have. Oh, okay. I always try to mulch it just to keep the weeds down because I don't like to disturb the uh, roots. Okay. Now, um, was any of your garlic kind of rotting at the soil line? No. That's eight down, and the questioning goes to Dorothy Kilgallen. Um, uh, and okay, so why did you pull up some plants to begin with? Uh, because of the 2016 right. okay. issue, I, I was sense. under the and the only images I could find of it said it was in too long. Uh, yeah. I've been pull, pulling it early, mm -hmm. and like last year's, I still have eight hanging from last year, and they're they're beautiful. Are, and uh, are you growing soft neck garlic? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, well, the first thing I'm going to suggest you do is switch to hard neck, or at least go half and half. Um, soft neck garlic does store for a longer period of time. But it's also adapted to warmer climates than we have, you know, another term for soft neck garlic is California garlic. And, okay. you know, you don't get those vibrant wrapper colors. And, no. and you don't get those amazing back flavors that you get from hard neck garlic. Which well, one, one year I did grow hard neck and the wife said I like the other stuff better. So guess what? She can get her own <laughs> darn patch. It's all, it's all her fault. It is. It always is. It is. Um, I, I would not advise, you know, I, I, I think quite honestly, it just got confused. Okay. Because in, in our part of the world, hardneck garlic is the way to go. Now, 
for peace in the house, I would suggest you, you still grow some strains of soft neck garlic. But I bet if you uh, did half and half or started another bed of hard neck that you wouldn't have this problem. I've never seen this. Oh, okay. I, I've had neck rot, and so has my garlic, um, but I've never had what you experienced even when I harvested a little late. Okay. But you did get some bulbs that were okay. They were nice size, good paper wrappers. Yeah, they're they're all they're all huge, uh, actually. And in, in 2016, they, it did keep. It mm -hmm. just was ugly, you know. Yeah. And okay. it, I don't think well, it kept quite as long. We're going to talk. I'm just trying to go, go ahead. You're going to talk about that. Um, is some of it discolored? What is different about it from last year, and this is the same garlic as last year, mm -hmm. is it's purple. It's got a lot of purple on it, and last year's were pure white and much smaller. So I'm assuming okay, I not... harvested sooner last year. No, you're not going to get purple from soft neck garlic. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's but... the sign of a hard neck variety. I've been confused. I um, am too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I want, um, are you been growing the garlic in the same bed or are you rotating? Rotate. Okay. All right. So what I want you to do is what I do with my harvest. You know, get it all out of the ground because it apparently is not going to get any better. No, and it's all out. Air dry it indoors in, in a cool, dry spot. I've got a, a porch with a ceiling fan that's a, the best place to cure garlic. And then when it's cured, do you have a food dryer, food dehydrator? I do. What I want you to do is take all the bulbs that are not perfect, chop them up, uh, dehydrate them until they're completely dry, and then go out and get a $10 coffee grinder that you will never... Yeah, but you've used it for coffee. No, no, it was bought to do spices, and it's never been used. Okay, great. You have a virgin <laughs> coffee maker. Okay, so take your dried um, pieces of garlic, whiz them up in the grinder, and then put them in old uh, spice jars... With those little, uh, do you, I, I always save those desiccating pouches and discs that mm -hmm. come with vitamins and running shoes. So put one of those in each jar, and you will be amazed at the flavor, at the intensity of this garlic powder. It puts anything you can buy anywhere to shame. Okay. And then just shot. use the rest as you would. And next year, I, I, I think somehow a hard neck fell in with your crowd, which is, you know, pretty easy to understand. Um, where'd you get your garlic? This garlic initially came from Tory's Butcher Shop, just bought to use. And we stuck some in, and we've been using it ever since. Okay, uh, good. I would recommend you move along uh, to real planting garlic. You don't have to get it certified virus-free. Uh, but I bet you there's some interesting farmer's markets near you. Possibly. Um, I would try to get a new strain uh, okay. from a local farmer. Sounds like a plan to me. All right. Well, that's it. Uh, you oh. almost stumped the chump. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry you didn't win the big money. Okay. All right. Take care, I, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You have a good day. You too, sir. All right. Bye-bye. Sarah, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hi, Mike. Hello, Sarah. How are you? I'm very good. How are you? I'm just ducky. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Where is Sarah Great? I am in Bethpage, Tennessee. Okay. Bethpage, Tennessee? Yes. We moved out to the country we, from Nashville, so we're about an hour northeast of Nashville. Wow. Okay. Big step. Do you like it? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, we're in the honeymoon phase, so I'm not minding the commute too much and uh, really enjoying the space. Okay, good. What can we do you for? Well, out in the country now, we have um, gotten some livestock. So we have chickens and turkeys, and we've got some sheep and um, some pigs, which I know that's a different story. Um, but we have all of their manure that I've been composting. Right. And so I need to know what I can do with this compost when it's finished, because I hear you talk about yard waste compost is better for my vegetable garden. And I um, have all this manure and it looks great and it's going to be great compost but i don't want to mess up my 
flowering vegetables. Oh, sure, sure. Um, now, uh, first of all, composted manure is different than compost itself. Now, on your new property, I presume you have a lot of deciduous trees that drop their leaves in the fall, right? Yes, no shortage there. So if you can suck up and shred your leaves, you can mix in um, the poultry manure and the sheep's manure. I don't know anything about pig manure. Plus, I mean, uh, uh, are, do they do they have bedding? Are they on a hard surface? Well, now we've got them out in the woods, so I really only have um, a little bit of that manure composting from when they were very first in a barn stall. Okay. Um, so that's kind of cooking down in a separate pile. Yeah, I'd want to look that up just because pigs are omnivores. Yeah. Um, now, one thing I can tell you about keeping pigs is they're the farmer's best friend. Because as my good friend George DeVault, who has a place called Pheasant Hill Farm, says, the best thing about pigs is they eat all your mistakes. <laughs> that is very true. Very Any true. vegetables that don't look perfect, I mean, that's that much less feed you have to buy. So the poultry manure in its uncomposted state is a very rich in nitrogen. But it's not weedy like horse manure. So it is really perfect to mix with shredded leaves in the fall. A combination of that poultry manure and shredded leaves should give you fairly balanced compost, um, but a little more nutritious than yard waste compost because it's going to have the extra nitrogen. Okay. I don't think, as long as you don't overdo it, it should not interfere with flowering. Now, if you want to take composted poultry manure, which of course means both the stuff that the chickens and the turkeys were done with and the bedding that they're on, that would be an excellent fertilizer for non-fruiting plants, like sweet corn especially. Or, you know, if you have one, a lawn, uh, potatoes, even though technically they flower, they can take more nitrogen salad greens, things like that. Just think of things that don't okay. flower. What about, um, I have some hardy kiwi vines and they're newer, so I haven't been to a point where they have set fruit yet, but I've heard that they're heavy feeders. Is that, do they like nitrogen or what does that mean? No, 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 no. Well, uh, hardy kiwi are fruiting plants. So they want a balanced fertilizer, so to speak, with a good amount of phosphorus in there. And okay. I would think that compost made with shredded leaves and your manures would be perfectly acceptable. However, I think even better, you have, you say, sheep manure. Yes. Which, if memory serves me well, and I think it does this time. Wait a minute. Where are my car keys? Um, <laughs> uh, is a balanced manure. Plus, it's pelletized, right? Um, I have been adding pelletized pine to their, and I wondered about that. It kind of breaks down into a sawdust with the, also then the, the sheep manure itself is kind of pelletized. So yeah. all together, I feel like it, that might balance it out better. Well, I'm not sure. Um, geez, uh, the, the sheep are mostly grazers, right? I mean, they're yep. out in the field right. too. Yep, yep. So, uh, so uh, do, you put, do you put them inside at night? Do they go into a little barn or something? Yes, yeah. And, and that's where the bedding is. That's right. Well, the less you can incorporate the bedding, the better. Because, you know, the, the sheep kind of poop like deer. You got a little, a little pile. Yeah. So if you can scoop up those piles, and even fresh, this is one of the manures that it's very safe to use fresh, you can spread that around the base of your kiwi vine and then just cover that with a little bit of soil or compost. That's a completely balanced fertilizer, and I think the kiwi vine would enjoy it. When, so, when people say something is a heavy feeder, you got to be careful about where you're getting your information. Corn is the heaviest feeder we grow, whether it's sweet corn, popcorn, or field corn. Um, but that needs a lot of food, a lot of sunlight, and a lot of water. I've not heard that about hardy kiwi. Um, 
but I would think that it would mostly just need a balanced fertilizer. And again, I can't think of anything better than your uh, than your sheep pellets. Okay. You really All went right. back to the land, didn't you, girl? <laughs> I did. Yeah, we went from zero to 100 pretty quick. We moved and we said, let's just jump right in. <laughs> well, you sound like you're enjoying it. Oh, yeah. It's been wonderful. All right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, God bless you. <laughs> Thanks. We're using a lot of your advice. I finally got my husband to never touch a bottle of Roundup again because of your love of flame weeders. That finally worked. So. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. You give a man a flamethrower, and he'll give up that devil's juice. <laughs> yeah, we're doing great. All right. That's fabulous. Well, thanks, thanks for calling. I've really enjoyed speaking with you. All right. Thank you. You have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Well, it's time for me to take a little break and remind everybody that the compost you began with lots of shredded leaves last fall should be ready now just in time for a late season feeding. Unless you filled the bin with lots of kitchen waste and then I urge you to just keep the lid on tight. But don't go researching what you did wrong just yet because we'll be right back with stuff and more of your stuffy phone calls. Is this the end of Rico? Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by the Espoma Company, offering a complete selection of natural organic plant foods and potting soils. More information about Espoma and the Espoma Natural Gardening Community can be found at ESPOMA.com. You're listening to an encore presentation of You Bet Your Garden. Welcome back to another all-new episode of You Bet Your Garden from the studios of Rodale Institute Radio at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. I'm your host, Mike McGrath, coming up in just a little bit because we are in the stretch now, cats and kittens. We'll get to the question of the week in which we will field three, maybe four different questions. It's coming up after a couple more of your fabulous phone calls. Jim, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Thank you, Mike. How you doing, Jim? Trying to stay cool. It's very hot today. Yeah, yeah. We're having a heat wave, a tropical heat wave. <laughs> um, where are you, man? Gilbertsville. Gilbertsville. Why, why does that sound familiar? Zern's Farmer's Market. That's oh, closed sure. now. Okay. All right. What can we do you for? Okay, Mike. Well, um, I have been using grass clippings to make mulch which turns into nice soil uh, however i just recently learned that those clippings if they've been treated with weed and feed can affect uh, your garden and tomatoes for example and uh, for the past several years my tomato plants have been non-bearing wilting leaves um, i really want to know if there's a i can turn around this process by using lime or something with the soil or <laughs> you wish you wish. Can't do that, huh? No. Um, now, I'm confused by your terminology. Uh, what do you mean by mulching your grass clippings? Well, I take them and I pile them up and I'll um, mix some existing soil and put water on it. And after two years, it turns into soil. Oof. Um, there's a couple of, well, first of all, if this was an acceptable thing to do, um, you would be much better off if you mixed small amounts of grass clippings with large amounts of shredded leaves. The composting process really depends on large amounts of carbon, that's what becomes the compost, and reasonable amounts of nitrogen, what we call wet greens, to feed the organisms that are fueling this transformation. I'm surprised you got soil instead of a stinky, horrible mess. Um, now, so your lawn is treated. Yes. Who treats it? The caller, me. 
Oh, okay. Now, um, when you bought your, I'm presuming it's weed and feed? Yeah, generic weed and feed. When you bought it, didn't you see the warning on the label not to compost the clippings after using this? Uh, well, actually, I took the bag out this morning, and I read the back of it, and there's no warning such as that. And I don't put it on the manufacturer to warn me necessarily that I should It's a federal law. <laughs> Oh, really? No, I didn't see any warning on it. It says it may affect other unintended plants. Is that the warning? No, no. Okay. Uh, oh, man. No, it's supposed to warn you very specifically uh, to leave the clippings on your lawn because whether you use them as mulch or whether you try to use them to make compost, the herbicides, the systemic persistent herbicides in use today will kill any plant that's not grass. So again, if you somehow insisted on doing this, you could mix some of your grass clippings in with your shredded leaves this fall, but the resulting compost could only be used safely on the lawn to feed the lawn. Right. Um, this is this happens all over the country. It happens to tens of thousands of gardeners a year, but they never figure out it was grass clippings. They call me and say, "I got a fungus. I got a, a, some some terrible thing, a pest or a disease." <laughs> and you know, these are the kind of people you could talk to them for twenty minutes before you got to grass clippings. So, right. But more importantly, one of the things we try to explain on the show is American lawns can be a closed loop. Grass clippings are 10% nitrogen by weight. 10% nitrogen is the absolute perfect food for lawns. So every time you cut your lawn and leave the clippings behind, you give it a gentle feeding. Every time you cut your lawn and take the clippings away, you slowly starve your lawn into needing more fertilizer. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason to, and, you know, one thing I always tried to express on the show, you're doing extra work. It has to be wrong. <laughs> you're, you're taking these things that you could walk away from, and then you're doing other stuff with them. No, no. Hard work is for chumps. <laughs> it is the best thing to do to leave the clippings on the lawn, and I presume that you have abundant fall leaves? Uh, a little bit in the back, yeah. yeah. So if you don't have one already, go out and get an electric leaf blower that has a reverse setting. Suck the leaves up instead of raking them up. Because if you rake them up, you have to bend over. <laughs> and bending is for chumps. <laughs> so with uh, a leaf blower set on reverse, you stand up, the leaves get sucked into the machine, they get shredded, you put them into a big pile, you don't have to add anything to that you will have premium compost the following year. Good. But yeah, this, uh, these persistent herbicides, people, and I don't understand why people feel compelled to use their grass clippings. Once you, once you figure out that these lawns feed themselves when they get cut, I mean, that's so much less work for mother. Well, if you dethatch your lawn, there's much too much dead grass pulled out you can't spread it out over the lawn. You got to rake it up. Uh huh. So who's overfeeding his lawn? Uh, well, this is dead grass that you pull out with uh -huh. a detacher. Yeah, I know. And what, you don't have a zoysia grass lawn, do you? No. Okay. Uh, uh, thatch, that brown stuff at the soil line, is caused by overfeeding with chemical fertilizers. Okay. If you stop feeding chemicals, everything's going to get better. The thatch will go away. And whether you believe me or not, um, leaving the clippings on the lawn helps eliminate thatch naturally because now you've got that biological activity down there at the soil line. Mm -hmm. There are so many advantages to getting off chemicals, letting your lawn feed itself. You'll save time. You'll save money. We'll send you a sham well. What more do you want? You know. <laughs> okay? Great. Yep. All I right. Get out of here and sin no more.
Okay, Mike. Thanks for the answers. All right. You got it. Take care, man. Bye-bye. Well, it is time for the question of the week. And this week, it's a triple. Yeah, we're hitting it into the right-hand corner and taking as many as we can get. It's about tomato rot, compost, wood chips, plus a special appearance by cuke-free cucumbers. We begin with Helen in Edmond, Oklahoma, who writes, my first tomatoes have blossom end rot. My research says the plants need calcium, even though I use new potting soil. The plants themselves are thriving, and I only water when the soil is dry, six to eight inches down. I use tomato blossom spray since the temps are reaching 90 here in Oklahoma. I looked at your website and can't find your past questions of the week, A to Z archives. Okay, so our archive of over 500 frequently asked questions is still there. But now you search by topic instead of alphabetically. And our website seems to have changed recently. The link you click on to reach all those articles now just says searchable archive. I'll see if I can make that wording a little clearer. But clear or obtuse, it's all at youbetyourgarden.org. Anyway, blossom end rot. I thought I was boring everybody with my endless repetition of the advice to save up all your eggshells and place the dried crushed shells of a dozen eggs in the planting hole at the time of your tomato installation to prevent the heartache of blossom end rot when the blossom end of your tomatoes turns black and rots out just as the tomatoes are ripening. You know, maybe I should just write it into the credits and say it every week. Anyway. Blossom end rot is caused by a deficiency of calcium, which, by the way, potting soils don't supply old or new. Now, at this point in the growing season, you'll have to make the calcium more quickly available. So place dried eggshells in a blender with water, whiz it all up, and then pour this calcium-rich liquid into the soil at the base of your tomato plants. If you ain't got no eggshells, whiz up a dozen calcium carbonate tablets a dozen tums, or a half cup of an organic plant food specially designed for tomatoes, like Gardens Alive, Tomatoes Alive, or Espoma's Tomato Tone, because they both have a lot of calcium. Don't forget to mix it in water. Temps over 90. Yes, they do have the power to fry the flowers on tomato plants. Not sure what your spray is supposed to do, but afternoon shade, as provided by a beach umbrella, should help. We move on to Mike in Berwyn, PA, who writes, I live on a half acre lot with lots of ash, poplar, and maple trees. Every fall, I collect and compost the leaves in a 10 by 10 foot space that's four feet deep. But I don't have the ability to shred that many leaves, and so they are whole. I just started adding fruit and vegetable scraps from the kitchen to the pile, and I was wondering if coffee grounds would be okay. Ay, 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 as I have said more times than Scrooge McDuck has dollar bills, coffee grounds are the best addition to an outdoor bin of shredded leaves. Kitchen waste is problematic in an open bin as it attracts mice, rats, and raccoons. Kitchen waste should be composted, always with a greater amount of shredded leaves, only in a sealed bin, or even better, in a worm bin. And you do have the ability to shred those leaves. Just go out and buy an electric leaf blower with a reverse setting and a collection bag, shred some of your leaves every day before you put them into the bin, and you'll have finished compost years earlier. We move on to Shane in Bellbrook, Ohio, which is near Dayton. Shane writes, I have a lot of arborist wood chips. They were delivered for free from a local tree service. Thanks for the tip. I haven't used them before, haven't really used anything other than shredded leaves before, but I'm using them now to mulch native perennials, including Joe Pie Weed, Bee Balm, and Black Eyed Susan. How much room around the base of these plants should be wood chip free, or is it safe to cover the base with the chips? Even though they're not drenched in poisonous dyes, arborist wood chips are still wood, duh. 
so they should never be mixed into your soil, only used as a one to two inch layer on top of your soil. And it is never safe to actually touch the trunk of a tree or the stalk of a plant with any kind of mulch, especially wood. Always leave six inches open all around your plants. All right, we finish up. I'd say come back, Shane, but I don't have to as there is a follow-up question. Shane writes, I also have a few cucumber plants that are growing like crazy. I'm getting lots of flowers, but I'm not seeing the number of fruits that I'd like. Well, until you mentioned the flowers, I thought you might have over-fertilized with nitrogen, like the classic rookie mistake of inhibiting flowering by using horse and or poultry manures on the wrong plants, specifically fruiting plants like cucumbers, tomatoes, peppers, squash, etc. But plants that flower without producing fruit are generally the victims of stress, especially early in the season. Cucumbers and summer squash like zucchini are notorious for this. Look carefully at the flowers. Blossoms with a little bulge behind them are female. Flowers with no bulge are male. Try using a small artist brush to transfer pollen from one flower to another to try and coax things along and make sure your watering regimen is deep but infrequent. No daily watering for short periods of time. Well, that sure was some interesting and important information about a veritable potpourri of do's and don'ts, now wasn't it? Luckily for those of you who wish to read this important information over at your leisure or your leisure, the Question of the Week appears in print at the Gardens Alive website. Just click the link for the Question of the Week at our website, which is still and will forever be You Bet Your Garden. Oh, Gardens Alive supports the You Bet Your Garden Question of the Week, and you will always find the latest Question of the Week where? At the Gardens Alive website. Yikes, my producer is threatening to let me back into the studio again if I don't get out of the studio now. I guess it's still Groundhog Day. And we must be out of time. But you can call us anytime at 833-727-9588 or send us your email, your tired, your poor, your wretched refuse teaming towards our garden shore at ybyg at wlvt.org. Please always include your location. Don't say you're in the kitchen or anything like that. You'll find all of this contact information plus answers to your garden questions, audio of this show, video of this show, audio and video of old shows, and links to our internationally renowned podcast at youbetyourgarden.org. Our radio show is distributed by PRX, the Public Radio Exchange. You Bet Your Garden was created by Mike McGrath. Mike McGrath was created when his mother, Nancy, put him up on a box and demanded he play a pinball machine using both fingers independently or he would not be allowed to buy the last copy of Fantastic Four number two at the corner store nearest the bingo parlor. Ken Queter plays our theme song. Our chief content officer is Yoni Greenbaum. Our angel of the airways is Christine Dempsey. Our engineer is always cheerful Charlie Sarah. Our social media director is Amanda Norfleet. Check out her fine work at the You Bet Your Garden Facebook page. Our peerless princess of profound production is Tavia Minnick. Our website wonder is Nicole Harrell. Our audio editor is the lovely Jonas Bowen. Our video editor is Judicious Jake Boyer. Our harassed and Harry director is Javier Diaz. I think Zach the Tack Wisniewski is in the house. Maybe Bill Semler too, but I can't be sure as the tachyon emissions have clouded what is left of my senses. And what can we say about our fearless leader, the Hellboy of Hellertown, the Ancient One of Allentown, and Bupkis of Bethlehem, Tim Fallon, who either keeps allowing us to come in to take new material or is too busy playing Scrabble at home to know we're here. I have no idea. And neither does Tim. I'm your host, Mike McGrath, losing my mind day by day, inch by inch, closer and closer until Niagara Falls. Slowly I turn and turn and turn and turn until Ducky and I see you again 
next week. You've been listening to an encore presentation of You Bet Your Garden. Two little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs. Two little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs. Two little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs. Support comes from Hot Bin Composters. Hot Bin Composters are designed to be compact, odor-free, and easy to use. With simple instructions and everything that's needed, Hot Bin Composters can help anyone get started with composting. More information is available at hotbincomposting-us.com.